Hi, what's up? I'm Ash, and I'm here with Bernie Burns from Rooster Teeth. How Hello. Are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm not bad. I'm not bad. It's it's been a hell of a day so far. I feel like we're running around. We're here in the YouTube space in New York. It's very exciting. Uh, this is some TVs for you to prove that we're in the YouTube space in New York. Because nothing says YouTube space like televisions. Like the back of televisions. <laughs> um, so, what are you in town for? How come you're all the way out here in New York? Because you're primarily based in in Texas. Well, you know, it's we're we're talking to a number of different people. I have some things to do out in New York, and then I thought it'd be fun to sit down with people like yourself. Okay. Talk a little bit about Rooster Teeth. One of the things that drives me nuts is Rooster Teeth is often called one of the best kept secrets in all of media. Right. And that's meant as a compliment, but when I hear it, I'm like, oh, I, just, I don't want to be the best kept secret, especially after you know 14 years of doing this. You know, we're really proud of everything that we built, but uh, we just want more people to know about it. So you're just generally spreading awareness of, of Rooster Teeth, like some sort of mass ad campaign. It's not the full purpose for the trip, but yeah, it's one of the things. I love that yeah. subtle service. It's like, yeah. it's like, no, there's actually some really exciting news, probably about Laser Team 2, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to go about how great we are. We're going to go to the broad strokes. <laughs> so how have things been in 2016? Because I feel like it's been a pretty shitty year. Lots of shitty things have happened, but some good things have also come out in terms of, of Rooster Teeth. He did a charity stream recently. Yeah, I mean, 2016, I don't get too wrapped up in years. Right. Um, you know, because to me, it's like if you get if you get too focused on the years, like Twitter right now, my whole feed is like, you're like, oh, thank God, the dumpster fire of 2016 is coming to an end. <laughs> It'll finally be behind us. It's like, it's not, you know, not, all the stuff you're upset about is not going to magically change on January 1st. To me, it's like our, it's like the current modern version of astrology, right? It's like, we right. think like, I get that people have to have optimism. Aside from certain things, 2016 has been a great year, you know, we've done some amazing things at Rashid. Uh We know that uh, Ruby, usually when a show hits its third or fourth season, that's when it really takes hold. And Ruby, it's like, we'd already been through this third season, we're like, okay, well, how much more does this show have? And then the fourth season hit, and it's just gone to a whole new level, so it's, you know, we have yet to see what that show is going to do. And so that's been an exciting part of 2016. Um, you know, we had our gameplay group start a Let's Play Live tour. Uh, doing live events like no one else has ever done before. And you sold that out. You sold most of them out because you were at MSG a couple of mm -hmm. months ago. Yeah, and that was incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's some nuts. of them. It, it depends on the venue, but some of them sold out in ninety seconds. They would put Jesus. it up and it would go. And like RTX, the same way. We had a uh, RTX. We had over seventy thousand people come to the one in Austin this year. We had uh, our first ever international one with RTX Sydney. So you know, twenty sixteen has been great. I was going to ask you that. How was RTX Sydney? Because I feel like transporting everyone from LA and and Texas over to Sydney must really like warp you in terms of your body clock. It oh, you mean all the, the people that travel from Rooster Teeth? Yeah. Yeah, because it's like, you know, the exhibitors down there tend to be local to Australia, because mm -hmm. uh, they have a huge video game industry down there, and they have representation for all the major studios there. Yeah, no, when we go down, it's there's some people that do a lot better <laughs> with international travel than some of the other people. Who is the worst traveler? Like, who, who when you look at, when you look at a list of everyone you're going with, who you're like, oh. Well, Gus Arola, who I've worked with for 14 years, he's pretty much the worst at everything. So he's just grumpy. <laughs> he sits on a plane and complains the entire time and everything, but he secretly loves it. No, I don't think grunt. Surely not Gus. Gus is so lovable and so charming and, and, and you know, complains about Civ 5 constantly. The best part about <laughs> Gus traveling is I know there's going to be a podcast story that comes out. <laughs> Something is going to upset him. And if it's an 18 hour flight, it's like, that's a gold mine. We can, like, we tell stories about that for a month and a half. Oh my God. And you recently started. Um, doing um, Dungeons and Dragons playthroughs as well. That's right. Are you moving more away from uh, the modern form of video game media and, and sort of nerdism and are you moving into the kind of more traditional aspects of that? Well, I think Rooster Teeth, because we started as gamers ourselves and we come from a genuine space, I think that we are evolving as gaming evolves as well. Like it's, it's when a director sits down to say, I'm making a new movie. They would say, well, are you making this for movie fans? It's like, well, what does that mean? Everybody's a movie fan, right? <laughs> and the same thing with gaming. Gaming's a bigger industry than, than you know, the box office for movies domestically, at least. It's a huge industry. It's part of everybody's life. I mean, gamers are all the way from what we traditionally think of the teenage boys sitting on the couch playing a game, uh, all the way to, you know, soccer moms who are playing Candy Crush on their phone. I mean, right. ga gaming is part of everyone's life. And so we just expand along with that. And when I mean, you talk about the Dungeons & Dragons show, uh, are groups that specifically are known for playing video games, like Achievement Hunter. Now they're expanding out into board games and other type of gaming as well. I mean, I think of Westworld as the world's greatest gaming show. It's like an MMO, yeah, right? It's so good. Yeah. Well, because obviously all the narratives running around. And I mean, I think... Quest givers and yeah. Yeah, it's all, to me, it's built like an MMO world. Do you ever get bored of being successful? I know that sounds like a really odd question to ask, but do you, like, you, you constantly... As a, as a unit are always successful and like you said you're the best kept secret in sort of traditional uh, modern media but it's like RTX success you've started up your own company massive <laughs> success 
you've got all these like great personalities out of it and, and this enormous like brand. You've had films, you've had spin-offs, you've got a subscription service that works. Like, do you ever kind of get like bored or are you always like No, I know what you're saying. It's not a problem that I think a lot of people could relate to, but you know, Rooster Teeth and Red vs. Blue, they weren't an overnight success, but they were about as close as you can get to that. I mean, we passed our wildest expectations for what we thought the project was going to do when we started it. We passed those expectations in about the third week. And so then you just have to set new goals for yourself. And if you look at myself personally, working on things like Laser Team and, and doing something and stretching and doing new programs, um, you know, I also, you know, act in a lot more things than I, than I used to as well. And I think the best part about Rooster Teeth now is uh, there's no other companies that are like Rooster Teeth in, in like the tier that we operate in because we're not a single name YouTube channel like it's not named after a person uh, you know we're not yet like Netflix or Hulu uh, but we're in a tier where we're providing all of the same content uh, that same level of quality of content that a Netflix or an Amazon or an HBO are making and we're making it for our audience and so we have a lot of room to grow in there and the thing that I love about it is being a brand and being an online digital brand it pr provides us with an opportunity to bring in new talent all the time bringing like the funhouse guys this year were a huge success for us um you know we have now our third generation of talent at rooster teeth and finding those new creative voices and helping them develop and helping them make new shows that's enormously rewarding for me i mean if you look at ruby our biggest show he, uh monty right. was an animator on red versus blue and it's just like well, do you have any ideas for shows? And this is what it was. Amazing. And you've got obviously m much more um, than just Ruby. You've got uh, Achievement Hunter, uh, Immersion is a really good one. Mm -hmm. um, when, you're, when you're looking at new ideas, when you're looking at new shows, what is it you look for? Like, what is it that, that kind of thing you look at? How does it work? Do you all sit around a table and you go, right, what are we going to do now? Have you got any ideas? Or is it very much someone go, hey, Bernie, I had this really weird dream last night when I was taking a shitload of mushrooms and we should 100% <laughs> do this. And you're like, maybe not. But I appreciate the idea. <laughs> well, the number one rule that we have when we're pitching new content or deciding what we're going to make is uh, we tell all of our content creators, make content that you would want to watch. Don't make something because you think there's an audience for it or, oh, there's this other popular show right. and we should do one of those kinds of shows as well. It's something that you have to want to watch yourself. And that's how the company started with us making videos that we wanted to show to our friends and make them laugh. And then we just grow that from there. And I think it's important because even though we can now have 250 people that work at the company, we have over 45 different shows that we have in production at any one given point in time, even though we have all of those things, we still wanna have that genuine voice that drives all of that. Right. You know, We wanna have the people behind it that are making it interested and engaged in what they're doing because that leads us to have interesting and engaged audiences. And it's quite a, a close-knit unit that you have at Rooster Teeth. You have your, your first baby was announced, Rooster Teeth baby was announced uh, live on a charity stream, right? Which is exciting. Well, we have had people had kids, but this is now the second generation, right? Oh, is it the, oh, it's the yeah. first of the second generation. So. Not all of us had kids while Rooster Teeth existed. Some of us, some of, uh, when I started, my oldest I think was two at the time, so right. I'd already had Jack, uh, uh, but not Teddy yet. So, but no, this is this is a new, a huge milestone for us because now, like the babies of the company are now having children and everything. <laughs> Growing up, they have kids, they have kids and everything like that. So it's really interesting to watch them grow up. And then we have a whole generation of, of talent and content creators behind them as well. We're like, I'll never have kids, but we'll see. <laughs> just, wait. just wait. And is it difficult working with um, respective partners? Because obviously there are, there's at least, to my knowledge, are there three people married in the office. Yeah, there's a few. I think. And you I mean, we have we work too with a, you know creative people tend to be attracted to other creative people. So right. and Austin's an interesting place to build a business because we've kind of been out of the limelight of Hollywood. And on uh, New York, right? And so we've been existing in Austin, which has been great for us. Uh, but as a content creator, there's not a whole lot of opportunities like there are in those other cities. So it's it's uh, we tend to work also with a lot of people that we know personally right. uh, in Austin as well. And then if we find someone who's super creative, we work with them on a regular basis. But yeah, we have about I'd say three different couples that work at the company, probably four or five. Yeah, out of uh, <laughs> 250 people. That's but, actually not that bad considering. Hey, if I leave anybody out, I don't want to hear about it later. That's <laughs> I don't want to see. And you personally, you're, you're dating Ashley on the note, and how how does that kind of work into the whole uh, dynamic of the business? Like, do you do you kind of feel odd going on or going on the no, or do you feel odd kind of working with her? Because I know you did a live stream recently at Thanksgiving where yeah. you sat down and played with the Nez. That was fun. I enjoyed that. I was amazed at the lack of rage controller because I feel like a cord's like this long, right? Yeah. But I also feel like 
playing those old games, you would immediately want to eject that controller out of the nearest window. Oh. With the system following it, obviously. I grew up as an Atari kid, so I've always hated the NES controller, which I know people who started with NES. It's like, that's the, the little D-pad is the controller. <laughs> to me, it's like, you got rid of the, the joystick. The joystick, to me, right. is like what was key to... Uh, you know, arcade games and everything like that. So when they came back with little thumbsticks, I was happier with like Xbox and PlayStation <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, no, it's, it, you know, it's challenging. Like Ashley, as an example, she's been in video games longer than I have. And she, you know, she's worked at uh, Ubisoft, she's worked for Xbox, she's worked for IGN. Um, and so then we started dating, she moved to Austin. I wasn't going to move away to San Francisco. She had just moved from Sydney to uh, San Francisco. And then she moved down to Austin. And it's a great example of, if she had ended up in Austin by any other means, we would have been very lucky to hire her. You know what I mean? Right. And so just, you know, there's ways that we approach it that we try to be smart because we've been doing this for a while. Like, I'm not part of, like, her interviews or anything like that. Like, if she's going to make a place for herself at the company, she does that with other people. Right. And gets to know them. And the no has absolutely exploded. Oh, I love it. Yeah. John and John, Gus, Ashley, they're all brilliant. I yeah. absolutely adore all of them. I probably missed two of them out. I'm really sorry. And it was a big, it was a big shift for us, too to do something that was news and informational because uh, up until this point, Rooster Teeth has been more so about the celebration of video game culture and like news and reviews were not our things. Right. So we started a whole separate part of the company, The No, different channel, um, has its own presence, has its own team that runs it, and it's worked out great. It's worked out really well. Do you find it difficult though because are you technically blurring the line between journalism and uh, machinima. Do you find that was it an easy transition to make, or was it something that just came quite naturally? Well, we have to we have to do a pretty hard line, you know. Right. Uh, where for sponsorships, obviously, if we're doing a story about Battlefield, if that story's sponsored by EA, that's right. a little bit tough to take seriously right. as a news organization. So we have to have a pretty rigid separation of church and state when it comes to sales and news. But they do have sponsorships. We just are careful about the ones that we choose for the news programming as well. I guess, kind of touching on that very briefly, did you ever, I mean, it was obviously a couple of years ago now, but how did Gamergate affect the way that you worked at Rooster Teeth? Or did it, was it very much just like, exactly business as usual, no big deal? Well, Gamergate was probably the most political thing, I think, that has ever happened in, right. the, in the video game culture. Um, and I actually made a tweet about it a few months ago, uh, as we were going into the final two months of the election, it's like, I didn't realize how much Gamergate was preparing us for the 2016 election right. season. It was, it, you can draw a lot of similarities in there. But did it affect the way that we approached anything? No. Um, I mean, I think we talked a little bit more about that than we did some other political issues. The reason we tend not to talk a lot about a lot of political issues on like the Rushi podcast things is not really because we're afraid to tell people what we think. That's a big part of our culture at the company and a big part of the content that we make. But a lot of it's not relevant to everyone in the world. Right. This was one of those few things where we could talk about it and everybody knew what we were talking about. You know, if we talk, a, we talk about a restaurant in Austin, <laughs> we don't stick it on the topic too long because we know that like, somebody is listening in right. London at 3 in the morning they're like, I'm not going to go to this pizza place. But <laughs> it sounds great. Yeah, if I'm ever in Austin, I'll, I'll be sure to check it out. Speaking it is rewarding though when people come for RTX and they go to all, every single restaurant <laughs> you've ever mentioned on the podcast ever. So they have like a checklist they have to go through. In terms of the community, do you ever... Do you ever delve into the subreddit a lot. Do you oh, all sit, the time. Do you, have you ever been doxxed or anything like that? Like accidentally doxxed or anything like that? Oh gosh, have I ever been accidentally doxxed? No, I mean there's little stuff, you always have to be really careful when you put a screenshot up or anything like that. Right. I'm like looking at tabs and everything and, and you know, anytime, it's almost like when you send an attachment with an email, I'm real like, I gotta make sure it's the right one, I'm real anal about that. So it's the same thing when you put anything out there. But right. we always look at the different aspects of the community um, differently. I think I spend the most time with our uh, first subscribers. That's probably where I spend the most amount of my time with journals and things like that. Mm -hmm. and I make a vlog for them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's our biggest individual group, which is right. great. I mean, that's the place you want to be in as a business when your biggest group is your subscribers. Uh, and then, you know, Reddit's closed, Twitter as well. Um, Reddit's a good concentration. I look at too at Reddit, um, the shows I'm on versus the ones that Reddit like. Reddit was... Uh, kind of, I feel like he's more of an offshoot of our YouTube audience, but right. they don't want to be part of the YouTube comment community. Right. So I think feel like the Reddit audience is more so part of that. And do you ever take any of their advice, or do you ever listen to anything that they say and, and come in and, and sort of talk to them on a level and then incorporate those ideas into your stuff, or are you very much just kind of more of a jokey advisory kind of? No, well, I'm trying to think of something. I know it's happened, but I can't think of a specific example off the top of my head, but there's certainly stuff that we've seen on Reddit 
um, that was posted other places like Twitter. And the Rishi subreddit has picked it up and elevated it. And it's like, oh, we weren't aware of this. Uh, whether it's, you know, people making compilation videos, uh, people doing fan art, those kinds of things. Right. Or, you know, people having an idea for a show. For immersion in particular, I always ask the audience, what should we be doing? Right. I it's, it's, like, usually right. get about 100 ideas and you get one that could possibly potentially be something good. Right. I, my ratio might be a little forgiving there. It might be a thousand <laughs> to one. But uh, everybody wants us to jump off of a tower into a bale of hay like Assassin's Creed. I'm like, we're not doing that immersion. It's just that would be pretty good though. We're, we're I mean, trying to figure out a way to do it. I like that. I'm just being like, you should you should ask for that more. Just do nothing but but literally just tweet at you. You should do this hay bale idea because that will never ever get irritating. And we should probably <laughs> it'll be the last episode of the last season of immersion. Gavin jumping off of oh, an 80 God. foot tower into a bale of hay. That would be great. With speak regards to Gavin, I was reading this mental um, conspiracy theory, obviously on the subreddit, that you met Gavin when he was a child. Yes. In London, and that's why you gave him a job later on because you kind of stayed in touch and and all that. Was that is that right, or am I way off the mark on that? No, no, you're right. So Gavin started posting to our website, right? And there's this, there's this post on there that Gavin loves, uh, which was he was I think 14 or 15, and he posted some videos, and they were getting popular, you know, amongst our community. And he was just this goofy kid in his background, backyard in the UK, just mm-hmm. jumping around doing silly stuff. And I said, I just made a comment. It was one of the first comments I ever made on his profile. And I said, long term, this site will be remembered as the place where young Gavin Free started posting his videos. And that was like eight years ago. Or now it's probably 12 years ago that I posted that. Right. And, uh, and he always kept that, you know. And then as he was growing up, uh, you know, got, he got involved with uh, high-speed photography through his apprenticeship in the UK. And, uh, you know, I was one of the people that was always pushing him to make a channel, um, you know, trying to do it because he had these ideas for what he wanted to do for Slow Mo Guys. And then right. he was actually the first person uh, we ever hired outside to come and direct a season of Reverse Blue. He directed season seven. I think he was 19 at the time when oh he did God. that. Maybe 20. And uh, so, yeah. And that was, uh, so I've always, I've always loved Gavin's work. I think he's a huge personality. And uh, him and him and Barbara Dunkelman, I feel like, are... The story of Rishi's Teeth, you can see a lot of it through them. Right. Because they were kids in their bedroom watching Rishi's content, one in Canada, one in the UK. Right. Uh, they started, you know, getting that creative voice on their own, and then they became part of Rishi's Teeth, and now they're two of our biggest personalities by far. I was going to say, is that how you look for talent? Are you constantly scouring sort of your audience, or are you scouring uh, as a whole YouTube and various other video showing websites to get the, the best talent, or do people come to you a lot and say, hey, have you got any spare jobs? Historically, we would look more to the community. I mean, right. uh, as many as, you know, two out of every three hires we ever made were from the community. Um, you know, like Luke McKay, uh, who did our uh, front page webcomic. Um, you know, John Reisinger, who is now a talent, who's mm-hmm. designing merchandise for us. Uh, but as Richard has scaled, we also have the opportunity to say, okay, we need somebody who's like a world-class compositor to right. go and work on Ruby. So we go out and hire that person as right. well. And then there's other opportunities where we look out and we, we draw people in from the community. I mean, in the past few weeks, we've hired people from the community and people from the professional industry, too. Um, Not that people who come <laughs> from the community are professionals, but they just don't have that experience yet. Obviously, it's, it's that whole thing of learning and, and growing. But I feel like what they don't have experience, they can definitely make up for in, in the right attitude. Because it, obviously, if they're... It's that genuine voice. Right. They get rooster teeth. We don't have to explain it to them. They know what we're trying to do. And they obviously already done with... They're, they're already heading the same direction we are. So I know we talked uh, briefly just about the Assassin's Creed immersion idea. But if you had <laughs> any, any money, uh, any money in the world, and as much of it as you could ever imagine, what would you like to do? What would you, what would you film or shoot or create? Well, there's, there's, oh, we've, we have those projects, like a whole list of projects we want to get done. Right. Um, you know, and Laser Team's a great example of that. Was, you know, it, that was the first movie that we wanted to make. And it was always going to be our next, next project. Right. It's like, okay, we'll do this one after we do this next project we have coming up. Then we'll do, then the next one comes along. We're like, okay, we'll do Laser Team after this one. Right. And then after a couple of years of that, we're like, what do we, stop, what are we doing? We want to make this, let's do it. So we went out and asked the community to help us. And we raised two and a half million dollars on Indiegogo through crowdfunding to make it happen. Uh, so there's other projects that are outside the scope of what we're, you know, can fund ourselves now and also what the audience could possibly fund through crowdfunding. Right. There are all the, there are those projects we have that exist. So I would make those, you know, get all those ideas out of my head and help Matt get those ideas out of his head as well. Uh, and then beyond that, you know, I would just make our shows better. I would love to take the Achievement Hunter guys and just put them on a tour bus and have them like just tour around for Let's Play Live because I think the tour bus would be like the greatest show in the history. Uh, of the world. Uh, I, there's some crazy fun stuff we'd love to do with immersion. Um, there's one we keep trying that we can't figure out a way to do without killing somebody, which is how do we do the Skyrim Fuzz Roda 
and blow people off their feet with air. Okay. And there's all this talk about science and rupturing internal organs, but it just seems like G-force can... ruptures. I mean, really, we could like, get you around that. You could make it almost like a, like a cross between MythBusters. You could do a, you could do a crossover show. Maybe yeah. get maybe get Adam and uh, Jamie and be like, hey, how do we do this without rupturing twelve people's? Build us a suit of armor that we can. Do. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's uh, that's one of the immersions I've always wanted to make. Is that one in particular? And when you're playing video games, what games do you personally enjoy playing the most? Well, I, I'm one of those people that when I play video games, I like I have blinders on and I tend to like play for like Friday to Monday and go through a game. Lately, that game for me has been Seven Days to Die when I play, when I play that. I tend to play a lot of zombie games. Okay. I like the independent title Contagion. Have you ever played that? I haven't. No. It's like the best FPS in the George Romero style zombies. Oh, like, no, proper zombies. Yeah. As in, I don't have a brain, therefore can't run, because that requires coordination. So right. I stumble. Right. And there's no like super zombies that like drag you with their tongues or anything None like that. that. It's just zombies. And it's like, whenever you mess up and die in the game, you're like, that's on me. I just got tired. I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, and got lazy. Yeah. yeah. So I, I tend to, I don't know why I tend to like zombie games a lot. I don't watch a lot of zombie movies anymore, because uh, there's so many of them. But uh, yeah, that and then I, I stuck with Fallout Shelter forever sure why. I played, I played Fallout Shelter for like a year, so yeah. So sometimes I play little little mobile games that I can play for five minutes, like Angry Birds, Happy Wings, you right. know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then sometimes it's like deep dive, like Fallout 4 came right. out, I'll see you in a week. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm stuck on Puzzle Quest, the Marvel Puzzle Quest game. It's, yeah. it's horrendous. It's yeah. like crack. It's awful. I do that as I'm incidentally scratching the back of my head, being like, y'all got any more of those star coins? I mean, I've been I've been one of those poor children that's been sat there for a decade going, I would really like another Final Fantasy game. Okay. And Amazon completely blew my order on day of release, which was great. So, I really so you're sitting that. here with no Final Fantasy? I got it yesterday. Okay, great. As in, uh, not yesterday, sorry, I got it uh, Friday. But I haven't played it yet. Because I'm I'm at this horrible point where it's just like, I, I, I once I start, once I crack open that disc, yeah. that's it. Like, game over. I'm going to be calling in sick for a week. I'm going to be like, no, I'm ill. Are you ill? Yeah, it's exhaustion. Like, my eyes are physically bleeding because I haven't slept yet for three days. And you're threading, you spo you're avoiding spoilers, I'm sure. Oh, God, like, like, I have, yeah. like, I feel so bad. Because like, I know that there's this whole thing about um, certain game companies have changed their review policy now, so it's only we'll hand it you 24 hours before. Which I think is a really poor idea. I'm not a fan of that. Okay. I'm not a fan of day one patches unless they're, like really good patches and add something that you didn't think was going to be in the game originally. I'm not a fan of 24 hour reviews because I feel like you should be giving them at least one week's notice because I, I think that what we've seen this year, or what we've learned this year I should say, is that a, a highly hyped pre-ordered game does not equal a good game. And the and people, a lot of people are saying don't get pre-orders anymore. Stop pre-ordering games because mm -hmm. you're, you're pre-ordering something you have no idea what you're getting. All right. you're seeing is a shiny trailer and that's it. So I feel like for me personally, it, it, it would be um, better to have every, everyone play for a week. Like you say, you know, you put the blinders on, play for a week, and then you, you really get a sense of the game. Well, I think there's a, huge, yeah. uh, there's a huge obligation on the part of the reviewers to actually play through the game as well. Right. The audience certainly expects that when they're reading a review from someone, they've played through the entire game. You know, and it's, it's, it's a hard business because if people don't agree with you, they take it very personally. Which is, to loop back to your question, which is why it's so frustrating with Final Fantasy, because the first thing everyone did was, well, here's the ending, and it's just like, what yep. is wrong with you all? Yep. Stop it! Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of, of spoilers either. But thank you ever so much for coming in to talk to us. I know that you're a extremely busy man. And enjoy New York, and hopefully it gets slightly sunnier, because it's miserable as per usual, which is why we're indoors and not outside, so...